magazine that's be, has been handed out to you. Uh, we're proud of that, that event. We're, we're a membership organization, and we do have membership forms in the back. We welcome you to join. It's not very much, $10 per person or 15 a couple. Our talks, just so you understand this, are always free. Uh, and so we have people who have not joined and keep coming to the talks, and then other, others who like what we do. We have 11 talks a year, and there is a schedule in the back. Uh, for instance, we're going to have a talk about coffee tree roasters and the history of that firm next month. We're going to have a talk about uh, uh, Tree of Life Synagogue, which is celebrating an anniversary in March. And uh, in April, we're going to have a talk about the continued development of the uh, nationality rooms at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we've had a talk before, but there are a number of different rooms that have come up. Later in the year, Chris Rawson, the theater, senior theater, theater critic, is going to come and talk about uh, uh, the uh, a book he's written on August Wilson, the playwright. And we also uh, have a civil war, I forget myself, civil war talk coming up in June. So we always welcome you. There are Tuesday nights, uh, second Tuesday <coughs> every uh, month except August. Uh, I think that's the background I want to give. Please, please come to other things. What we're going to do tonight is Helen Wilson, who is our vice president, and also you have seen her name because she's a regular writer in the Squirrel Hill News. You'll see her article next to our anniversary article. Helen is going to talk a little bit about a subject that she's very interested in, which is the streets of Squirrel Hill. And then she's also going to talk about something that we're going to try to do more of in this group, which is to get some research projects going. When, when we started, there wasn't a lot known about Squirrel Hill history. The Arcadia Publishing Company that puts books together and you've seen them in Barnes and Nobles, these local history books with pictures. They pushed us hard to do a book. And so we did one. And through that book, we really began to understand the history of Squirrel Hill better. And that book's still available, and we sold over 4,000 copies. And uh, it's been really important for this group because for the first time, we understood the general themes of history in Squirrel Hill. What we would like to do now is get deeper. You know, we, we often get calls on our we have a website, and we often get calls, and people say, well, do you know anything about this block or that block? And we don't really have that level of detail yet. And Helen has notions of, of some research projects that she wants to do if we get volunteers that she wants to tell you about. So that will be part one of tonight. <coughs> part two. I want to have a discussion about retail in, in Squirrel Hill. And again, this is in part to begin to get a better understanding. One day we'd love to have a map, produce some maps, in which we show the stores in Squirrel Hill in, 20, in, in 1920, 30, 40, and 50, and make that available. Tonight, what I'm going to ask those of you who are from the neighborhood, and not all, not all of you are, I want, and I want you to think about this before we talk about it. I want you to think about the three merchants that are no longer here that you miss the most. And we're going to go around the room and have commentary. And, and you can tell us a little bit about the memories that you have. So without further ado, Helen? How many members in the group? About a hundred. Yeah, yeah. From what I heard, I think maybe we should just go right to the retelling. <laughs> no, 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 you. Uh, no microphone tonight, so I tend to get softer, so if you can hear me, um, just raise your hand and let me know. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be giving a talk until Michael said, can you do this? So um, what this grew out of was um, Squirrel Hill Magazine is put out by the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition, which is a different organization, and they're dedicated to... Um, making, keeping Squirrel Hill as a uh, the wonderful neighborhood it is. Um, they're, they're careful about um, um, the way buildings are put up and um, beautifying the roads, um, planting the trees, things like that. Um, 
they're interested in the now and future. And as Michael said, I do have an article that is about Squirrel Hill's past, and it's always tied into the theme of whatever magazine, whatever issue is out. And the theme this time is the visions for the future. And the art, this magazine is full this time of people writing about what they envision Squirrel Hill to progress into, into being. Um, I wrote about what the visions that people from the past had of this area, um, before it was this neighborhood, I'm sorry, even before it was um, settled. Um, I read an article that the editor liked. Um, I wasn't quite as happy with it as I wanted to be, so I wrote a second one that was a little more specific as to the streets, the streets of Squirrel Hill, because what I found was that these streets are a pattern of the history of the people who shaped not only Squirrel Hill, but in some cases, the whole United States. So um, as we think about research projects, one of the ones that I would like to do is have people research their street or a street that in interests them and compile these. Uh, please don't give me your tons of research. Somebody just gave me a stack of research on, on the Gertie family. It's this thick. But we don't have time to go through that, but if you write maybe a 500 to 1,000 page, uh, not page, I'm sorry, word uh, report about the street that you're interested in, we'll compile them into a, a, a binder and keep, keep it with, a, with our archives and maybe do a report about it. But anyway, um, that second article that might or might not see the light of day, as I said, dealt with some of the people who the streets of Squirrel Hill are named after. And uh, I'm going to start with Forward Avenue. If any of you were here for the, for the um, talk about Judge Forward, um, amazing man. Um, he lived 1786 to 1852. Um, his estate was located where Taylor Allardyce is now. Um, he served in the United States Congress. He was Secretary of the Treasury under President Tyler. Um, he had a whole lot of other things that I couldn't fit into a 700 word article because I wanted to do a lot of other things. But um, he, his work, I'm sure, could fill a book, his life. Um, when he returned to Pittsburgh, he served as presiding judge of the District Court of Allegheny County. But again, he lived in Squirrel Hill. Um, moving on to William Wilkins, uh, 1779 to 1865. He served in all three branches of the United States government. He was Secretary of War under President Tyler. He served in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and as Pittsburgh City Council President. He covered everything. Um, he purchased 650 acres in the east end of Pittsburgh and built a stately mansion to entertain his guests in great style. Not only Wilkins Avenue is named for him, and um, speaking of Wilkins Avenue, that was once his private road into Oakland. Um, when you have 650 acres, you know. Um, but also Wilkinsburg. And I don't know, but I assume Wilkins Township as well. Um, now, some of Squirrel Hill's present day streets reflect the British tradition of giving names to, their, to estates. And Wilkins' estate was named Homewood. So that's where we get Homewood Cemetery because um, that was part of his estate. Um, um, before 1900, Homewood Avenue ran all the way through Squirrel Hill to Shenley Park, and it's now Northumberland Street. So you can see this on old maps, which of course you want to look at a map and you, uh, two hours later you realize where, where has the time gone. Um, now a tiny street near Browns Hill Road has I wrote it was the grand, has the grand moniker of Federal Hill Street. It's the last vestige of Federal Hill, which was the estate of John Turner. Lived from 1755 to 1840. He was 85 when he died. So, you know, if you lived through childhood, you had a pretty good chance of living to, to a good old, good, good old age. Now, he owned 145 acres in Squirrel Hill and Greenfield. He was illiterate. And he was very, very bright. He was raised by Indians for the first 10 years of his life. I mean, I've been studying that part of Squirrel Hill for a while, so um, 
um, John Turner's life, uh, that could be a book. Um, he was illiterate, but he valued learning so much, he bequeathed land in his community for a school. It was one of the first schools in, well, what is now Greenfield, but it was all part of Squirrel Hill then, and it was up on, um, off of Winterburn. Um, but he also gave the land to build a church and, and turn a graveyard as well. Um, he's known as the benefactor of Squirrel Hill. And if any of you go into the Squirrel Hill post office, um, I have a feeling that that guy in the middle of the mural is John Turner. I have no proof, but um, he certainly could be one of the candidates. Now, Browns Hill Road, which is right near Federal Hill, and where that big intersection is at the top, um, Browns Hill Road is named for William H. Brown. He lived from 1815 to 18, 1875. Now, he owned all of the hillside um, of the, um, the, from Nine Mile Run to down towards um, the Greenfield part. I'm not exactly sure how many acres he owned, but he mined coal there. And he also had a lot of coal mines in a lot of other places and acquired a huge fleet of steamboats and barges to carry the coal all the way down the Ohio River as far as New Orleans. He was called the Coal King of Pittsburgh. And during the Civil War, he risked his, risked his life supplying coal to Union, tri Union troops. Um, he was captured and almost executed before one of the Union generals realized who he, who, who he was because it was the Union troops that thought maybe he was selling coal to the Confederates, but luckily that was straightened out. And he and his sons eventually became well known for their philanthropy. And um, I said in my talk a few months ago that his son William is the, the guy who has that beautiful pyramid mausoleum at Homewood Cemetery. Um, the Brown family, um, very wealthy family, um, endowed Mary Brown Church, um, maintained the cemetery. Um, and did a, an awful lot of other, other very important philanthropic programs. Um, now, General John Forbes was a British general before the Revolutionary War, 1707-1759. This is the French and Indian War. He was best known for capturing Fort Duquesne, and he gave Pittsburgh its name. He named the city of Pittsburgh. Now, Forbes Avenue cuts through the heart of Squirrel Hill, but Forbes never marched here. For this is not Forbes Trail. Um, he took the route that's now Penn Avenue, so he kind of skirted the hill, as lot, lots of people did. Um, Murray Avenue, named for Magnus Murray, 1787-1838. He was the fourth mayor of Pittsburgh. Now, there's a lot about him. I have one sentence. He supported public improvements and human, humane causes. Magnus, M-A-G-N-U-S. That's a great name, isn't it? <laughs> Scottish. Scottish? Scottish. Scottish. Um, it's interesting that you say that because um, I, if nationalities are important, if you look at Wilkins, um, I read, we have a Tompkins in Turner Cemetery and I read that if there's an S at the name of a, of a word that sounds, a name that sounds British, it's usually Welsh. So I'm not sure, but um, maybe. <laughs> so, um, Murdoch. Murdoch Road and Murdoch Street are named for the Murdoch family. They own large, large, huge tracts of land in Murdoch Farms, that area, um, and also in Oakland. They had nurseries, or orchards, greenhouses, hothouses. Um, they produced plants, seeds, fruits, and flowers, and they were the premier um, uh, nursery in Pittsburgh. They, they supplied floral arrangements for all the major galas downtown. Um, um, they had a retail shop four stories high on Smithfield Street downtown, and they were abolitionists. They used their house at the corner of Murdoch and Darlington as a stop on the Underground Railroad. And that is the only sentence I can find anywhere about them being, that house being part of the Underground Railroad. It's just mentioned, but nothing else is known about it. Um, 
There, one of the Murdoch women was also very famous as a, um, she was an, let's see, a temperance leader. She was a, um, she served with the troops in the Civil War, not in the Army, but as a, a person, a nurse who took, who uh, organized aid, aid to the troops. So it was just an all-in-out great family. Um, Thomas Whiteman, 1818 to 1904. He was the owner of the Thomas Whiteman Glass Company, vice president of one bank, director of another. Ten acres, he had a 10-acre estate, which extended from Whiteman to, to Murray Avenue along Forbes Avenue. So he owned all along Forbes. He was described as a man of wide and diversified knowledge. So it's fitting that only not, not only Whiteman Street, but also Whiteman School was named after him. <coughs> Shenley Drive, that's about, it's one of the few Squirrel Hill Streets named after a woman. And of course, we know Mary Shenley. Um, and that's as far as I got, because when I, have, when I write articles for the Squirrel Hill Magazine, I have a limit of 700 words. So stop there, but there are so many other streets that, um, um, Beachwood Boulevard, for example, is named after Frew. Well, I think it's William Frew's estate. Um, if you ask me about other streets, I might know, I might not. Um, the Streets of Pittsburgh book, we had the speaker here. Um, he gives one or two sentences about the, pe the, sh the names of the streets and where they come from, but when you start delving into um, the history of these great men, especially, and some women um, who are memorialized, memorialized by these streets, it, it makes a great history lesson. Um, now, if anybody's interested in, in doing research, there's two wonderful websites that are major help, so you don't have to go to the library unless you really can't find it here. Um, Historic Pittsburgh, are you familiar with Pitts, University of Pittsburgh, Historic Pittsburgh website? It's, it's wonderful, images, photographs, um, um, maps, um, full texts. Also, what I, one I really like is Pitt, Pittsburgh Historic Maps, and that's an Esri site, and it has maps that overlay each other and fade into each other through the time, so that you can, um, you just run the little slide across the top and you can see Squirrel Hill developing before your eyes. <laughs> so, anyway. What's that um, site, please? Um, the site, it's, it's got a long name. Um, so I just Google Pittsburgh Historic Maps because that's the name of it, but it's peoplemaps.esri.com slash pip year here. <laughs> I have a few more of these which list those two websites. Um, that's all I have to say right now. Helen's going to come back and talk about other potential research projects after we go through some other subjects tonight. But before I come on, anyone want to comment on things you know about some street names? We are recording tonight, so this is all stuff that is going to go into the uh, Historical Society archives and be part of our ongoing uh, research project. So any comments on some other streets that you know why they were named? Uh, what, what they were? I'd like to know why Kinsman Road was named Kinsman Road. Have you heard of it? It's right across from the Homewood Cemetery. It's, off, it's between Wilkins and Northumberland. It's parallel. I, I don't know, but I It exits on uh, where Linden School is, back of Linden School, where the pillars are, the brick pillars on both, both ends. You know, that whole area there is really interesting because you have these fantastic street names like Ellsboro, Northumberland, Marlboro. I mean, these are all elegant English, names. Really. Yeah, and plus on some maps it shows a series of lakes, little ponds, mm -hmm. or large, large ponds, small lakes. Um, at least three of them, that, and even some reports of quicksand. So, what was there? <laughs> Um, as you follow these maps through and see how like Homewood, Homewood Avenue changed. Um, but where did these names come from? It could have been something like the builder, mm -hmm. just the builder maybe naming it after relatives or, 
well, and another example is Regent Square was named just because it sounded English and elegant. Um, but then we have people like, um, we don't have an Alderdice Street, but Alderdice was a school, school board member and the president of um, some steel company. I forget what. But anyway, these, that's why the names are so interesting, because where did they come from? I'll try to find out. Okay. I will. And, and as a goal, we will start turning this into more structured research over time. What about uh, that? What's straight? That's Oakland. Um, right. But that's still interesting. <laughs> right. Any other uh, comments tonight before we move on? What about I, Murray Hill? Um, you know, that's been on the maps for a long time, Murray Hill. So I was trying to find if that was connected to Magnus Murray. Someone said it was, but you never can be sure. So I, I'll look into that more. I did try to find it, but as up till now, I wasn't successful. Actually, Murray Hill is, is a street that we're going to be able to find a lot out. Because Murray Hill Street Avenue is the only place in, in the East End, uh, well, there's one in Oakland, that is a historic, a federal historic district. And when they qualify, we'll get this, but when they, and if you are interested, you can leave your name and we'll get it for you. When they qualify to become a historic district, someone had to do a history of the street and the area, which is available publicly, and we'll, we'll go track that down. Murray Hill Avenue Many of you have been along the, the, the rocky street of uh, Murray Hill Avenue and all of the uh, nice houses there. It's, a, uh, it's an interesting place. And, and again, the one place, there could have been others, but the one place where the owners there took the initiative at one point to get it historically designated. It's not necessarily the most historic street in this area, but the owners there you know, took the initiative to, uh, to get the designation. And um, Willa Cather, any of you know the name yeah. Willa Cather? Yeah. 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 She lived on that street for a Samuel while. Samuel McCone's house, I guess. Yes, yes. Yeah, she was there for a couple of years in Pittsburgh. We had a talk about her two, three years ago. So there's a lots of, one of the themes we're going to do, and Helen will come back at the end to give you, this organization has mainly done these meetings and put our book out and have walking tours. We'd love to take it to the next level now, but we need people to work with us to do these kind of research projects and get in deeper in, in an understanding of the neighborhood. I mean, that's we see as the next thing to do. But let me, anything else on the streets? Just, just one quick question. Do you have a first name from Judge Fortward? Walter. Now this isn't on streets, but uh, mm -hmm. off of Beechwood Avenue about 20, 30 years ago, I know these people that would go off, the, the road went, it was the road before you got to uh, the Homestead Bridge, maybe about three, four blocks before that, it was a dead end road and there was a cave. There was a cave in it, and I used to go in it. So I, I was wondering if anybody ever heard well, of it. Are you sure it was a cave and not a mine? I don't know. I there's, never was in it. Uh, they, there's they mines. It in. <laughs> there's some mines on the map around the area you're talking about. I'm not, I, I'm not sure if that's exactly where, but I know there's one up on Birch. 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 The dead end one. Not if there's. Uh, Is that off Beachwood Boulevard? Yeah. That might have been it. Up Luster. Yeah, I know there's one up by under Landview somewhere. I mean, my kids have seen it, and they, they were warned to stay away. <laughs> but there was also some near Timber, where Timberland Courts are now. Mm. So the, there are mines, and it could have been. I, caves, well, that I would depend. I don't think there was any limestone. <coughs> no. There, so you, you no, know. they would have been either, either mines or very shallow sandstone. Okay, so, I don't know. Yeah. How long has Shady Avenue been around, and do we know who named it? <coughs> Shady Avenue is one of the oldest roads. Could have been an Indian trail. Um, it was named just because it was a shady lane that you could drive along. Yeah. That's we don't know who gave it the name, though. No, it's just very, it's as old as saline, 
saline and right. shady are about the two oldest roads in the area. Go ahead. Yeah, well actually on shady, what's the story with the that weird stone wall thing on top of Shady Bar Beacon? Because that's pretty You know, I know. There's, there's, that has to be from a mansion, but I, I keep meaning to research that, but I haven't yet. But it's obviously that it, it was, it's obvious that that was from a mansion. Um, in fact, even you can see those um, even where I live, which is um, um, down towards Shady Avenue Extension and Beachwood, which is way on the other side. Um, there was a manor house, and there's these huge, huge stone, sandstone blocks that were built because of the manor house. So. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it must have been a horse trough or something. Yeah. 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 They're, they're around. That's urban archaeology. <coughs> what about Pocasset <coughs> Street? <coughs> oh, yeah. I should know that. I'm sorry, I don't remember, but um, it sounds Native American. I would have to double check. Okay. By the way, just a note from our, um, our uh, work on the book and stuff. Um, we realized, and, and this will also lead to where I'm going to take uh, the next step in this, we realized in doing our research that Squirrel Hill, or at least the part up the hill, is really a, a very young neighborhood. And it's a lot younger than the part as you get down towards Greenfield, which was near the river and therefore there was more access. Squirrel Hill came later, and at least some of the estates that, that Helen has just been mentioning who gave also the name to streets, uh, those were really still rural, large rural estates with farms on them. And most of the names that you have not heard in, in Helen's list, people that were really uh, sort of a mansion or estate owners in turn of century, they were, they were older than that. Uh, be, when Squirrel Hill had changed from being just farm and Indian and Native American land into the beginning of being developed, but was still the most rural area around. I want to make sure we have exhausted all the questions from Helen, because I want to take that theme and bring us forward to the rest of what we're going to talk about tonight. Anything else right now? Helen, can you, we'll have you back up to talk about the research projects in a little bit. What we discovered in doing the book is that you could always, almost put Squirrel Hill in themes, the history. You had the uh, up on the hill, Native American trails, uh, families like the Turners and stuff. And then you began to get some, some estates, but, uh, larger farms. Any of you have seen our Squirrel Hill book, we still have pictures from late 19th century of farmland in Squirrel Hill. But sometime around the same time, also, the development of the mansions that you were going to hear about tonight began. And those mansions weren't necessarily with huge amounts of land. Some were. But a lot of them were, you know, be beginning to be more urban kind of mansions. Uh, some examples that still exist, and there are not that many, but uh, there's a mansion that's attached to Temple Sinai on Ford's Avenue. There's the Mellon Hall in, um, uh, in, in Chatham, which was uh, the, the, the first major home of the Mellon family, now is the centerpiece of Chatham. I don't know, I don't know if you do, Helen, how many acres that ever had. The, 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 the mansions along Fifth Avenue, which we were all looking forward to hearing about tonight, I never had the impression that they were, you know, 100 and 200 acre pieces, that they were smaller, but they, a lot of them developed around, you know, late 19th century, early 20th. A fair number of them were Mellon family mansions. We would have heard that tonight, not, not all of them. Um, there, was a, there were some mansions on Beechwood. One, that we have researched it was called the Thaw Mansion. It's now torn down. Mr. Thaw was was well known. We've had a talk on him for later on shooting the fame, killing the famous architect Sanford White over, a, over some kind of lover's quarrel. But the Thaw family had been a major family in Allegheny City on the north side, and then it, then, then it had come in here 
and built a mansion. Where, and again, if you look at our Squirrel Hill book, we still have a picture of it. Uh, there, there are a few mansions left on Fifth Avenue. There's one a man named Henry Hofstadt owns a white, I don't know if you've seen this, there's a white mansion which was designed to look like a Sanford White design building in Newport, Rhode Island. And that still survives. But what we discovered was that by turn of century, Squirrel Hill was starting to be connected through the trolley, particularly, uh, and then later through Boulevard of the Alley. But the trolley up Forbes Avenue was critical. And at a certain point, an awful lot of these families decided it was more profitable to subdivide their land than to keep the mansions. How many of you have been to Chatham? To the Frick? One of the remarkable things about Chatham is that uh, the, the, uh, the Frick daughter, Helen Frick, even though she lived in New York for many years, insisted at a time when all so many of the mansions were being torn down and subdivided into profitable land developments, that she insisted that that building not be torn down. And after 20, 30 years of being in New York, came back and created this, this wonderful community resource that we have. But most of the owners did not do that. Most of them said, look, there's a lot of pressure coming. People wanted to get away from downtown, and so they wanted to come up and live here. And so they said it was, it was more profitable to tear down their houses and make the money on, on dividing um, the uh, uh, you know dividing the land. Uh, the uh, I, I, I think, what, what was tell what was the name of the farm Murdoch. down here that you mentioned? Murdoch. 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 Murdoch Farm uh, by the turn of the century uh, was starting to be subdivided. Uh, I live on a house on Northumberland Street that was part of three houses built in 1907, right on the edge of Murdoch Farms. And it just, price of land, got too valuable to keep the houses. And it is at that point that the, re the Squirrel Hill that we know now was really getting to be developed, when you've got these houses with lots, but small lots, the kind of urban-suburban mix that Squirrel Hill has that many of us love and find very unique came out of the subdivision process of the mansions you were going to hear about tonight. Um, when you start to get, get more and more house development, and the, the heyday of the house development in Squirrel Hill, we found out, is really from 1900 to 1930. That's when a lot of the stuff that you see in this community was built. Now, when you start getting that, you begin to get the <coughs> pressure for the other thing I want to talk about tonight, which is the, the retail section downtown. You begin to want to have folks serviced. And the retail section is is a little, we don't have enough history on it. And tonight, you're going to be part of a little bit of a research project in a minute about that. But um, the, the earliest that I've heard about a retail being developed to really service the new residential community was in the 20s. And we heard a story about a man, a Jewish man, uh, who founded something that still exists, although you don't hear much about it anymore, called the Jewish Board of Trade. And the Jewish Board of Trade began to service a limited number of Jewish merchants that were opening up on Forbes and Murray. And interestingly, the, the, the guy who did this uh, also founded Beth Shalom, and later on, even because he wasn't a conservative Jew, went over and helped found, uh, became a very active member in, um, uh, in uh, uh, the synagogue in Oakland. What's the, the big? Beth Shalom. Shalom. Yeah, Beth Shalom. And then later, the family went over to help form Temple Sinai. So they went, they were reformers, they went through, but he, when he asked the Jewish merchants in downtown Squirrel Hill what they wanted most, they said they wanted a homegrown sort of conservative synagogue. So he helped get the money together to build the Beth Shalom Temple on Beacon, and there, there she wrote. So it has just been hard for us, because there's been so much change over time, for to, to um, uh, 
sort of get a good catalog of, of the ever-changing nature of the gem that is downtown Squirrel Hill, as I call it that. And I thought it'd be fun, and I hope you work with me on this, to, for those of you who live in Squirrel Hill, we're literally going to go around now. And I want to ask people to uh, think of two or three merchants that they miss, and a little anecdote of both, and we're going we're gonna to use this to begin to build a, a research project. So will you, will, will you work with me on that tonight? And we start here. If you're not from Squirrel Hill and haven't used the downtown, you just have to tell us. I'll be glad to start. Um, I, I don't really know anecdotes about it, but uh, some of my favorites were uh, Barnes & Noble and um, Glifty's Restaurant. Oh, yeah. And uh, a pleasant present. Oh, yeah. yeah. Down the hill on, on yeah. uh, Murray yeah. Avenue. Yeah. The, I could name the more, but okay. I just missed them all. I second what she said, but I'd add pole eyes, of course. Mm -hmm. yes. You all know what happened with pole eyes? Why yes. it's shut down? Did you, mm -hmm. Does everyone yes. know that story? Father dies, and they're two sons, and they can't figure out how to work together or how to split the resource. And in the end, it, it goes bankrupt and gets shut down. It was thriving as long as the father was around, and the sons worked on it, but uh, it, uh, it never recovered from that. Wild best. What? It's just been vacant for all these years. Why don't they just, is it there any way they can sell it? And Pardon me? Why don't they sell it? Oh, that's an interesting story. Some interesting. of the people in the room know this. That corner is a top priority for the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition to get developed. But it's a very difficult corner to get developed because figuring out how to do parking and having off-street development with the two big roads coming in. So there was a plan that was a lot of people spent a lot of time on, might have even included a hotel, mm -hmm. it and it's fallen apart and it's delayed the time in which someone will actually do something about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's very active work going on on that at this point. Let's keep going around. Oh, I, I'd say the same thing, the Lippies and Barnes and Noble. Um, I wish there was another Barnes mm -hmm. uh, bookstore nearby yeah. that you could walk to. As we go around, let me try to make sure to push this as far back, you know, older memories as, as well as newer ones of, of stuff that maybe is even more long gone because, because there has been a lot of shifting. Um, I, there used to be Weinstein's restaurant, oh, yeah. and there used to be uh, what was first Rhoda's uh, Delicatessen, oh, yeah. right. Right. and then it became Kazansky's, and then to my dismay, one day I went to eat there and found out it had been sold and it was an Asian restaurant. And um, there used to be a lot of bookstores in Squirrel Hill. There used to be a Squirrel Hill bookstore, and, as well as the Barnes and Noble. And uh, we also had the Squirrel Hill Theater. We used to have two movie theaters. So. You know that they were operated by the same folks who do the manor? No, I didn't. Yeah, so they, get one. It was the Stern, the Stern family. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, by the way, the Stern family that still owns the manor is an old movie family that used to own movie theaters far more than Pittsburgh, outside of town, and then they, you know, narrowed down to 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 this operation. The Squirrel Hill Theater was supposed to be part of the same development block that hasn't gotten off the ground uh, along with pole ice. That whole corner <coughs> is supposed to be done. Yeah, I miss pole ice too, like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> Anita? Uh, well, I really grew up in the Hill District <laughs> with a lot of the immigrants, and by the time I moved to Squirrel Hill, a lot of it was gone, so I never really became a, somebody who uh, felt strongly about different places here. And, uh, Newman's Children's Store. Uh, I bought all my children's clothes there, plus um, school uniforms there. Then on Murray Avenue, there was Saul's Market when I was a little girl. Um, 
they occasionally would have delivery of groceries because we were young then and we didn't drive. We weren't old enough to drive and my mother didn't drive, a lot of mothers didn't drive back in the 50s and 60s, so they delivered uh, food. I'm trying to think what else was up there. When did Newman's go out? Do you remember? I think in the, I'll tell you, I think it went out in the uh, early 90s because really? my, my son's mm -hmm. My friend's son is a couple years older than my son. My son was born in 88, and I think they went out in the 90s. And I'm trying to think what else. Well, Adele's and Linton's were the clothing stores for the ladies. Now, Linton's is still uh, down at the waterfront now, but Adele's is gone. Of course, there's Little Shoes is still there. Well, Shoe stands out as one of the old retailers that's still there. A lot of restaurants now. I think there are too many restaurants. <laughs> right. <laughs> Funny story about restaurants. As you know, there are a lot of Asian restaurants now in the neighborhood, and uh, we've noticed that with all the Asian students at uh, the universities, sometimes when one of the new restaurants opens up, they have what's sometimes called a soft opening, and they're packed because there must be some sort of informational pipeline down to the university to tell them that they ought to try out this new restaurant. Do you have any idea why Adele's went out? Uh, no. Okay. What? The husband and wife both passed away, and the daughter-in-law had it for a while, and then she wasn't interested anymore. That generational change it seems to be a big deal in a lot of these stores. Mm -hmm. That the, the the next generation isn't there to. Uh, I mean, they talk. You, you talk a lot about losing out to the bigger stores, and, and that's true. But the the fact that that the next generation doesn't want to keep one of these things going seems to be a big has been a, a, in a, as neighborhood oriented a, a retail section as we've had seems to have been the case often. The malls took over. It got too hard for them, but, but some of them may not have been excited about their parents' profession anyway, who knows, you know. You guys don't live in Squirrel Hill, do you? No, I live in the Bubba and Sherman's used to be here. It's her line. Oh, sorry. Yes, her line was Bubba and Sherman's line. before yeah. long. That was a restaurant <laughs> there in the middle, on Forbes across from the middle, I think it's that location. And sure. then the theater up there on Forbes, there's another, they had four theaters actually. The Gill and the, uh, what the other one called? Forum. The Forum, that's it. The Forum and the Gill was here. And they're not theaters anymore. When did those other two theaters go out? They went a while, I forget. The yeah. Forum was probably in the 80s. 80s, and when did the Gill go out? Right near Forbes and Shady. Would you, would that go out? Forbes and Shady. Then how about the little store, the shoe store here? Was there a bus to buy the shoe store? I, I past middle is going towards Shady. There's a little shoe store there, I remember. I always right. shoes there. But I don't know what that name was. It was a small shoe store for kids. I don't remember the exact name of it. Juvenile Shoe Shop. What? Juvenile Shoe Shop. No, it was a, it had, I don't think it was, there was a couple there. Yeah, it was a different one, like Buster Brown or something. Do you remember that? 28 Forbes Avenue. What? What was it called? 5828 Forbes Avenue. <laughs> No, they don't. They don't remember the names. Yeah, but I don't forget. The name. I think it was called Buster Brown Shoes. I think. I used to get shoes there. I didn't live here, but I came in to get my shoes. Yeah. Well, I remember that one story. You, it was going down the hill on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. You went down in the basement, like, and they had all kind of records. Yeah, and, heads together. Oh, heads together. Heads together. together. Yeah, yeah, I sort of missed that. That was u unique. Going well, down in the basement. Yeah. Like that. Heads together. Is, is that completely gone, or did they move somewhere? Does anyone know if they had a successor store anywhere? There's still something down there. I think they sell bongs down there. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
Life moves on, doesn't it? <laughs> I remember all the bakeries. There were so oh, many yeah. bakeries and so many beauty shops when I was yeah. in high school. Waldorf's, but there were so many bakeries. And so many, so many beauty shops all the way up. And I And I have to tell you, my husband's not from Squirrel Hill. He's from out in Bethel Park. When I met him and we came here like 45 years ago, he still talks about how everyone used to double park their big cars. They would just park their cars and go in the stores. Right. And they never did that, of course, out there. Yeah. Double, so. par double park. Yeah. yeah. And Minio's has been here for a million years. They're and still here. And it's now expanded, or it's now expanded. Yeah, there's another, yeah. They took uh, Engels Market. Mm -hmm. They took the fruit market. Engels. And expanded. Engels is gone. We had uh, uh, we we had Minios come and and, and talk uh, mm -hmm. to us when uh, the history of Minios one time. I had a uh, the former uh, the, the, my daughter's former uh, father-in-law um, was was had been a Pittsburgh native and then had moved out to Milwaukee and was also a sports fan and. Every time there was he stayed a Pirates a uh, Steelers fan, and every time there was a big Steeler game, he had Minio's FedEx out pizzas, <laughs> and, and they told us that they on big uh, football weekends they would do that. A hundred or hundred twenty people from out of town would order pizza from him. <laughs> My brother lives in Arizona, and every now and then for his birthday, a family member will have a Minio's pizza sent out to him. Right. Roger, what do you remember? I remember the um, bagel store on Murray. Oh, bagel, 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 bagel Land, thank you. I gotta tell you my story. For a while I developed an allergy to wheat, so I couldn't eat them. But my office loved them. So periodically I would be charged with stopping on the way to work, picking up three dozen fresh bagels and driving them to work. I absolutely loved the smell in my car. <laughs> and what block was that on? Oh, wow. Murray. Murray, yeah, Murray. Yeah, it was on Murray. Um, up past Beach Place, a little bit farther up, right? Next block up, I think. I forget where it is. I thought it was, it was, I thought it was it about was, Phillips. Yes, yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. Somewhere Phillips around there. up to Hobart. If you're going yeah. down, it was on the right side. Yeah, right it was down near right. Minios. Wasn't it above Minios yet? It was below. Yeah. Yes. Oh, below Minios. Yeah. I have a question for everyone. Has the um, the stores have changed? as we're talking about. Has the amount, in the last 20 years, has the, the places that were retail stayed retail, or has there been any shift, say, old retail places into, into replaced by housing or vice versa? Or you pretty much said a few 20 years ago how much retail there was going to be, and it's just a question of what it is. Still the same. It's the same. It's basically the same, although you've got office buildings now in yeah. all the corners. There's a big building, right? A building that was Gulf Station. Yeah, Gulf Station. That was Black. Mr. Black owned that. Mm -hmm. And during World War II, we kids would bring <coughs> rubber and metal up there, and they'd buy it for the war effort. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, rallies. The movie stars came to Forbes and Murray to raise money for war bonds. I remember that. Who was the movie star? Who, uh, uh, the uh, the guy that played uh, Hercules, or in the movies, I can't remember his name. But he was there. He was there. Or no, maybe he played. Uh, maybe it was Lars. No, the no, he no, played the Bible guy that held the. Uh, and that, huh? you have a memory. Well, I was going to talk about the Gulf Station. But, you know, there were many drug stores. The uh, at Beacon, the Beacon Pharmacy and the Marfield Pharmacy and Rosen's and, uh, Rosen's and, Rosen's and Sunny's. Phillips Pharmacy. I have to have it only one person talk, please. Lo loads of drug stores and kosher butcher shops. <laughs> many, many of them. What was it? What was the time when there were if you can remember this, what decade with the largest number of kosher butcher shops? Can you remember? Uh, <coughs> 40s and 50s. Okay. Yeah. 
Do you have the impression that the percentage of Jewish population of Squirrel Hill was higher then than now than that? Yes. Uh, I was always surprised at the, the numbers myself, but is there, uh, I don't think the Jews were ever majority. I've heard 40 percent. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I've heard. I, I just wonder, I don't know 50. if they, if it went Never up higher for a while, but that's, no. that's what I hear now. I'm not from Squirrel Hill, but I do miss Baskin Robbins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. 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 Uh, um, okay, uh, of the ones that haven't already been mentioned, Cayman Chevrolet no, and the National Record Mart. Wow. <laughs> Where was the National Record Mart? Uh, it was up. Murray and Darling. Well, it was on the same side as uh, Cayman Chevrolet, uh, or the Bagel. It was approximately right where that Bagel Land Bagel uh, Bakery is now. I don't know what it's called. It, it's, 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 it's a bagel place. Maybe I can't remember the name, believe it or not. But it was half of it was a bagel place. Half of it was uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. That's it's called the Bagel Factory. Bagel Factory. Okay, so it was right around that location, maybe give or take one or two storefronts. Yeah. Where was the Chevy place at? Pardon? Where was the Chevy place at? The Chevy, the Chevy place is right. Well, it was actually right on the corner of Forbes and Shady. And Shady. It was right where the, it, it eventually became that Forum Theater. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what was down below on Ford Avenue? Was there a dealer down there on Forward Avenue? Yeah. Yeah. Apart from the Square Hill Theater. Was there something there too? There, yeah, yeah. There was a Buick dealer there. Uh, I knew there was a dealer because there was a big building down there. Mm -hmm. were, oh, yeah. Were there any other dealers? Uh, up around uh, Forbes and Shady besides Cayman, or was it the yeah, old one? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, at one time, you could buy just about every make of car in Squirrel Hill, with the exception of Ford products, for the obvious reason. <laughs> uh, you had at least a dozen auto dealers in Squirrel in the greater Squirrel Hill area. What year would that have been? Hmm? What years was that? Oh, this would be going back to the 40s, 50s, up to the 60s. <coughs> yeah. Um, not from Squirrel. Okay. <laughs> not from Pittsburgh. I remember a bunch of different places. I remember uh, London Fog, the clothing store where the bike shop is now. Okay. It was like a, mid, like a kind of teenager store. London Dock. Yeah, London Dock. Dock. There was uh, Bagel Dock, which was the restaurant. Oh, yeah, Bagel Dock. Where, uh, here's the Bagel Factory is. Um, of course, Squirrel Hill Hardware. Um, what else was there? Um, all the bakeries. Uh, oh, there's a flower store. Yeah. I mean, the Oliver's is gone, but there was also another flower store, I think, on Phillips and Murray. That's where the French patisserie is. Right. That's right. And, uh, and then there was Meatheads, the uh, burger place uh, where Dunkin' Donuts is now. I think that opened in the 80s when that building first went up. Oh. Remember that? Yeah. Um, and there was another pharmacy, I think, on the corner of uh, Shady and Forbes. Rose was. Yeah, Rose was. Well, Jim Rich's uh, clothing store, where was that? <coughs> and what was its name? Um, I don't re remember. <clears throat> what I did mention was Roger also said, I came to Squirrel Hill with Patty in 1980 <clears throat> on Hobart Street, and it was the Bagel Factory. Okay, I come from West. What I have it, a bagel? What's a bagel? <laughs> <laughs> you realize there were only two bagel producers bagel factory and they had another one on the south side or not south but west whatever and it's hard to to believe you know just I don't think Squirrel Hill caused it but my gosh suddenly the hottest business deal a young couple could get into is go out in Montana and start a bagel factory <laughs>
and um, fabulous. That's only 33 years ago. I want to say Jim Rich's store was on Forbes on the south side of it. I, I'm not sure about that. But that's funny. Jim Rich is a friend of a number of us uh, and was, was head for all of the Squirrel Hill Business Association. It was in that new section where Starbucks is at the top up here. Starbucks used to be Blockbuster. Yeah. Remember Blockbuster? Yeah. Was it Rich Frank? Is the yeah. health, Rich Frank. some health uh, stores. It's that block that was there is where he had his men's, <laughs> men's warehouse, right. I think, yeah. took over right. after that. And then right. now, okay. and I think it's now a, um, um, it's a medical rehabilitation <coughs> little area. Physical therapy. Yeah. Doesn't anybody remember Weinstein's? Yeah. 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 Someone mentioned. Did they mention it? What kind of what kind of restaurant was Weinstein? Oh, it was a real pleasure. It was the most wonderful restaurant in the world. It was a real deli. What block was that on? It was on the corner of Beacon. Beacon and Bank. Or the bank. Or the bank. Oh yeah. It's the first first day. Let me keep going so everyone has a chance. Do you the uh, does anybody remember the AMP from Murray Avenue? Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. 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 That was the uh, people that founded the guy. Yeah, they told us that story. Cool. That was there was also to the, the little house. Hungarian restaurant on Bartlett Street. Yeah. 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 And uh, it was Pearl Richbaum's that was right at was Murray and uh, Bartlett, where the Giant Eagle is now, if they're parking yeah. Was that a store? It was a manor drug store. Remember Schulberg's, which was next to the OK on Murray Avenue, then the Atlantic gas station right on the corner, <coughs> Sunoco's on the other side of Bartlett. With the car wash. There was a Sparkle Market down at Ford in Murray, yeah. and the thoroughfare at Beacon in Murray. <coughs> and that would all be around 1949, 1950. Thank you for that. That's yes. nice I grew up there, so I remember yeah. it. Yeah. Daddy? Well, I came in 81, and um, I came from New Orleans, and, and I was very disappointed that there weren't enough restaurants in Scroyle, <laughs> but there was everything else we needed for the young family. There were clothing stores, there were two children's shoe stores, of course there were two hardware stores, don't forget Ratner's that had everything, and um, the, bagel fact, the bagel land, and the bakeries, it was, you could really do all your shopping in Squirrel Hill. And yeah. not liking malls, it was the perfect place for us to go. Yeah. Well, you could buy your furniture at Arthur Moser's. That's right, that's right. That's right. And, and <coughs> I knocked with Earl Hill, <laughs> so I'll pass. Yeah, how about Silverberg's Bakery? Across from Maiello's Pizza, next to Games Unlimited. And uh, Herman's Bakery, Phillips and Murray, where the hair hairstylist is in there now. Um, how about Spyro Realty? Corner of Beacon and Murray, across from Weinstein's. What year was that? That was in the early 70s to late 70s, and way before, I'm sure. And um, how about uh, the Beacon Theater? That was where Galifti's. You can still see the marquee. Yeah, you can see the, and later became the Guild Theater. <coughs> was that a first run movie theater? Or? Yeah. The Beacon, I think, was a first run, yeah. yeah. <coughs> now, the Guild, when it became the Guild, it, they were showing uh, older films. Yeah, there were a lot of good places. I need to avoid side conversations so everyone can hear it, please. I'm sorry. Yes? Hold on, wasn't there a hairdresser on the corner of uh, Forbes, or I'm sorry, Murray and Beacon? I miss I was thinking of Dottie's. Yes. Where was I, please? Right next to the Cafe. Right along there. You know where Uncle Sam's is? I did. Yeah. Yeah. When, did I, when did Isley's go out? Um, 20 Early 80s. Early 80s. I was here when I was here. It's the only place we had soda fast kind of place. 
<laughs> they called it Sweet Williams after I visited. It stayed as an ice cream place for a while. After I visited, close up. Sweet Williams was like in the mall. I saw Sweet Williams in other locations. They had something to do with ice cream. They were the same company, I thought. In addition to ice days, around the corner you had the Waldorf factory, which lasted a long time. Um, at one point we had a, a Russian restaurant that lasted for about four years on Monday Avenue. In the first three blocks, I can't tell you which. I know, that's what it was. That's what it was. It didn't last very long at all. It <laughs> <coughs> um, was odd and it's five and ten. Which I think went into the space for the PA on Murray Avenue. Uh, there was a hat shop in the next block Estes. on Estes. Uh, and I think there might have been one on Forbes Street around where Baskin Robbins was in the 50s. And uh, the one on Murray Avenue was where the dentist's office or the op optometrist is across from the post office. There was a place that made draperies um, on Murray Avenue. It was the post office, and I think there was an A&P, mm -hmm. and the, the, the uh, drapery place um, in that block. And there were lots of bakeries. Everyone, the bakeries keep coming up. Right. So, so now they're restaurants, and before they were bakeries, right? Yeah. <laughs> Always food. Always food. Yeah. It's uh, Shirley, well. Shirley, do you have? The only um, bakery that hasn't been mentioned yet is Rosenblum Bakery, mm -hmm. which is occupied um, for the uh, bakery. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty big one, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was. It was yeah, because we get a, quite a few questions on the website about those books. I think more than others. You know, so people remember that one. Rosenbooms was a good place to go after a date on Saturday night to get pot rolls. Yeah, because the side door on Hobart Street was open. And I have no idea whether the money that was paid for rolls that we bought there ever went into the cash register or the stations in these pockets. <laughs> Let's come on around to this row. Um, my most vivid memory is of going to Wendy's with my grandmother when I was a little kid. Um, but I was curious, I know um, that you mentioned it, but I was wondering what was in the spot, the Giant Eagle. Anyone that remember what was in the Giant Eagle spot? That was the OK Grocery. Mm -hmm. They changed the name. Yeah, the OK the, 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 the didn't OK start yeah, across the, the street? Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. it wasn't yeah. Murray Grocery. Yeah. Okay, that's where Pearl Rich Bombs and the um, right. Hungarian restaurant. Okay. Where was Pearl Rich Bombs? Pearl Rich Bombs was an upscale uh, grocery store. Okay. They moved into East Liberty. Yeah, yeah. After um, the when they left. Well, the thing. Avenue. Well, the building caught on fire, and they couldn't save it, so all of that okay. was torn down. <coughs> Wildorf. We just moved to Pittsburgh in July 2012. <laughs> Where did you come from? Where are you from? Uh, from the UK. I'm from Northern Ireland originally. If we were at least fairly newcomers ourselves. Come around. How about the Beacon Club? Anybody remember that? The Beacon Club was a gambling club next to Weinstein's restaurant. After the war, when the boys came back from World War II, a lot of the Jewish kids got jobs selling siding and home remodeling. They used to congregate, maybe 20 of them, on the corner and exchange uh, stories about their travels through West Virginia selling siding and home remodeling. And after they were done with their stories, they went upstairs to the Beacon Club. It was a big gambling club up there, next to the Weinstein. Um, I would say I miss the bagel mush and the Waldorf and Sirloin, which I guess was Bubbles and Sherman before it was Sirloin. It's not a memory necessarily. I notice there's a lot of dancing places coming in here. 
when I came here in 1987, I came here, there seemed to be coffee joints were spreading out. So maybe we have a future with a lot of dancing places. Coffee, all that stuff. Nothing left to say. Yeah, okay. Me, strike one. I'm not a Pittsburgher. I'm from Philadelphia. Strike two. I'm not a square of a resident. I'm from South Oakland. But there's no strike three. I have something with you guys on the same page. First, Barnes Noble closed. Square Hood Theater doesn't exist. Then, Gulliver's gone. But other two stores gone too. Panera Spread. Shut down, in, I guess, in August 2010. That's where the Pamela's Diner is right now. Another one is, I remember at the southern end of the Morrow Field Apartments, that's where, where the Murray Avenue and Morrow Field meet, there used to be a store run by some, I guess, Russell Jew. Since there's only once I stepped into this store and then I overheard some, something I didn't know, the language. I believe that was Russian. Um, the, the, the theme that he just touched on and the, and the feeling of loss, I would, uh, clearly you, we, you hear that from, from folks about the neighborhood. Uh, on the other hand, um, one of the answers to uh, the question, the comment, there's so many restaurants now is, uh, we're glad we have them. You know, in other words, Squirrel Hill came under, if you want to call it, assault from, uh, from uh, the waterfront and, uh, yeah. and economic issues with the Barnes and Nobles of the world that they just, that, that they're retrenching and stuff like that. And yet, um, despite lots of pessimism when someone sees a, a, a vacant store, they keep getting rid of it. It's, it's, I'm a newcomer. I mean, I was here since 2000, and one of the things about new, newcomers who have lived through less of the cycles than some of you have is, is uh, probably less, you know, the word jaundiced. So I just, when I see, I know it's changing, but when I see the new stuff coming in, uh, I consider this one of, the, one of the really, and I travel a lot, one of the really viable local neighborhoods that I know anywhere. But it has changed, and uh, you've shown that tonight. Before I wrap up this part, are there any other comments people want to make? Yeah, I remember one other place. I remember Ice Comics had a little shop in the Moorfield apartment, because I would walk home from Alderdice to Greenfield every day and pick the best stop, because I could just pick up a comic book. And uh, that was there for, I don't know, probably five, six years maybe? Remember Frank's clothing store, the best store for men's clothing. In Rich, Rich Frank, wasn't Rich, it? Rich, Alex Rich. Nobody yeah. mentioned the hot puppy shop. Oh, oh. yes. That's that. That's funny. <laughs> that was at the, right around the corner from the Mar uh, the, the uh, Marfield drugstore at Forward and Murray. I think the pizza That's place really is there now. Yeah, have you got a green grocer? Did I hear anybody say the green grocer? That was another interesting story that was gone. I have one more. The corner pocket pool hall. Remember that? It was a, my brother used to play there all the time. It was right up from um, Murray and um, is it Phillips or Hobart? Right up the corner. <coughs> Big pool hall. We recently lost the Tango Cafe, which was very popular. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know why. Oh, we used to go in there, and uh, <coughs> yeah. she got tired of waiting to see the ups and downs of that plan there. Yeah. I mean, in other words, it's not clear in my mind whether she, the last few years, wasn't just waiting to be bought out, and then finally got uh, wondered whether she ever would be bought out by some new development. I understand Action Housing owns uh, the corner now. Really? Yeah. The beach place is yeah. there. There's one place left in the Did they corner. buy it in the last couple of years? Yeah. 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 They bought it. Stay, stay tuned.
<laughs> that's that's uh, new news to me. Down there on you know, as someone who, as I said, came here in 2000, I want to thank you. The picture you painted tonight is a wonderful picture of this this vibrant neighborhood. We will we will build on this information, and we will have some more discussions like this because that's part of what a, a historical society should be doing is not just speaking to you, but getting memories from you. Um, I want to say a couple of administrative things and then ask Helen to come back up to wrap up with some of the ideas she has for other things we could research in Squirrel Hill if we have enough people. Uh, Helen's a wonderful researcher, but she's one person. And we would you know, love very much to, under our direction, to have people look into some of the projects you're going to hear about in a minute. Because we, we've been around long enough that we should, as I say, get to this level so one day we really can give a picture of what it looked like in 1930 along Forbes and Murray and 40. I mean, it's, it's one of the big things that a historical society should be doing. And you made a nice start tonight. Membership in the back. Someone asked only 100 members. We haven't pushed our membership particularly hard because uh, we don't spend a great deal of money and, and you know, haven't needed the money and have really been more interested in, um, in having people come to our open talks. But we would like members and we <coughs> would like you to join. And it's not doesn't cost very much, so please consider that. And we hope you like tonight and we'll come back, those of many of you who are new, we'll come back to some of our other lectures as we go along. Patty? And don't forget emails. Emails. We need emails to give information out. That they would give email addresses. That's that's right. And we right. have a great website. That's right. We have a email list. We send membership notices. We send reminders of our meetings every month. It's free. All you have to do is sign a sheet in the back with your email address. This doesn't even require becoming a member. And then we'll, you'll be on our regular list uh, to bring you up to date on stuff. And today, there are many of you here who are new, so we couldn't warn you about the illness. But there's a lot of people who are not here tonight because they were looking forward to the mansion speech. And we had their emails, and we were able to warn them <coughs> that it wasn't happening tonight. So, Will it be uh, rescheduled? Pardon me? Will it be rescheduled? Yes, we want, we will, but our schedule is full now until November, so it, it's going to be a while before we are able to do that. Helen, would you come up and talk about some of your other ideas? Thank you very much. And after we shipped him ashore, he was ready to be born in 1944. As far as research, you can uh, Just a couple more minutes, please. Okay. Scott, Scott is Thanks. Um, what happens when I research is I am researching one particular thing, and there are 20 tangents that I want to follow, and I can't. Now, these are personal things that I came across as I was researching other things. Um, and as I said, if you would like to take one of these ideas or um, come up with your own and just um, do it on your own or work with me, uh, whatever. Um, I hate that phrase. I'm sorry I even used it. But anyway, here's some of my ideas. And the first one is comprehensive. It's documents and transcripts of everything that was ever written about Squirrel Hill. <laughs> My collection is getting bigger, <laughs> but um, long way to go. Um, I've been interested in the electrification of Squirrel Hill. Um, you know, we have George Westinghouse um, nearby Point Breeze. Um, there was a point where Squirrel Hill, where electricity came into Squirrel Hill. Before that, it was the arc lights. So that's an interesting topic. Um, this was one of the few industries in, around on Squirrel Hill, not in Squirrel Hill, but on Squirrel Hill was brick making because we had the red beds. Um, uh, location of the old mines, gas wells, and quarries. And we might have a talk on that at the end of next, of this year, hopefully. Um, I'm also interested in when Squirrel Hill got paved because some roads were not brick first. They just paved them with asphalt. Uh, 
which I didn't know they had the technology back then, but they did. Um, I'm also looking to, into every political entity Squirrel Hill was part of, from the past to the present. Um, Colfax School District, which was a school district before Pittsburgh Public Schools became a district. Um, and Colfax itself celebrated its 100th anniversary a few years ago. Um, not only where the names of the streets came from, but where some of the institutions, where the names of the institutions came from. Um, this is a minor one, but the connection of some Squirrel Hill businessmen to the Johnston, Johnstown flood as members of the country club there. Um, detailed histories of Frick and Shenley Parks. Um, there's an early frontier history. There's ghost roads there. Um, the names of the paths might reflect some of those ghost roads. And I noticed that you go down Browns Hill Road, um, when you go to Somerset, it's not Old Browns Hill Road anymore. They changed the name of that little part of the road to Park View Street or Avenue. And that's because originally that's what the name was. Is there was a road called Park View. So I was a little mad because I saw Old Browns Hill Road disappear, but um, it's still farther down. Um, history of street railroads, railways or trolleys, that's really what made Squirrel Hill what it is today. Um, we got an email about somebody who was interested in the story of the people who were electrocuted while riding in a carriage in Shenley Park. Um, what? Yeah, the electric, this ties in with the electrification. You know, the, um, if you've ever read any of the books about Westinghouse and Edison, um, there's a real battle about whether you use the safe DC current which didn't go too far, and the very dangerous AC current was, I the think, battle I right. between them was between direct current and alternating current. Right. And um, they had pros and cons, but um, that's why sometimes people were electrocuted. Um, I personally am researching the history of Turner Cemetery and the Brown family, and there's always more to research. That, that ties in with the Gertie family as well. Um, history of the Masons. Um, a lot of the businessmen in the early 1900s were Masons, and I've been looking for a speaker, um, just in case. Um, in the history of the other clubs, like Kiwanis, I don't know of any of others around here, but... Um, and finally, uh, research on the Civil War soldiers in the GAR section of Homewood Cemetery. Um, it's a very somber place, and it, it really is badly in need of restoration. So that was my list, but um, if you like any of those ideas or if you come up with your own, we'll work with you. Um, to to uh, close up, you know, we have a website. You can get to it through Squirrel Hill Historical Society. Uh, so Patty Hughes here in the back maintains it. It's got lots of valuable information. Also, uh, information on the speakers and background on them. I, I urge it. It also has a communication page where, which has been developed as much as we'd like where people can ask questions and we try to get answers for them. I urge you to take a look at that. And one personal note, I'm, I'm man, we're a volunteer group and so the phone number you see is really mine. I will be out of the country for five weeks in, in uh, late this month in February. So that phone number is going to be answered a little tardily. Please forgive us for that, but uh, I'll be back on March 1st and with you in March and Helen will we'll help run the meeting in February. So please come and see us again. Thanks for coming tonight. So.